Hi, I am Rob Bowell and this lecture is on an interesting ecological and chemical occurrence in nature of elephants traveling underground in lava tubes to make use of the cave salts which are formed by the weathering of mafic alkaline volcanics and their reaction with groundwater and bat guano. So this talk actually started in its origin in a university friend of mine inviting me to go caving when I was living in Kenya with my young family. I was there as the uh, chief geologist for uh, a mining company in East Africa and Ian uh, is um, an elephant zoologist. In fact, he did, he did his PhD on primates. He actually worked for Diane Fossey um, and the Digit Foundation in uh, Uganda and uh, Rwanda. And Alan Warren is a zoologist at the Natural History Museum. And uh, we went caving uh, in the Kitsum Caves. And the, our specific purpose was to see if we could see evidence of the elephants going underground there and to try and understand a little bit more about why. Now, elephants, as you know, are fairly large animals, yeah? I presume all of you have seen one before. That's the, the gray thing in the photograph there. Um, I have to say that because I, I gave this talk, actually, uh, in Australia and at a university there. And actually, one of the students had never seen an elephant before. And, had, and because I didn't think about it, I, I didn't give a context in the, in the photograph of what an elephant was. Um, most of their nutrients actually come from water. They're actually very poor at eating. They digest typically less than 30% of what they eat, which is why they tend to eat during the day. And so a very important part of their diet throughout Africa and Asia are things called gastroliths. Now, gastroliths are rocks or soil which you can derive nutrients from. Uh, geography is actually the study of looking at soils and rocks as nutrients. However, as you can imagine, much in the way that human beings are affected by their activity, so are elephants. And you can see here that the elephant in the photograph on the right is a senestral elephant. Its left tusk is actually shorter and more worn than the right one, showing that that's the tusk, the dominant tusk it uses. And like a number of mammals, like ourselves, elephants show a preference for uh, dextral or senestral activity. Now, a number of elephants occur in an area of Africa called the East African Rift Valley. Now, being this department, you're probably very familiar with the idea of rift zones. If you're not, Bob will throw you, probably throw you off the course. There's a very large one that goes down th from uh, the Arabian Gulf right the way through the east side of Africa called the East African Rift Valley. Uh, it's, it's characterized by having a series of mafics, a very alkaline uh, tertiary to very recent volcanic. Some of them are still active centers. And you've probably heard of this peak, which is shown in the photograph here. This is a horror point at the top of Kilimanjaro. Its uh, elevation is 5995 meters. Um, and, and it has a permanent glacier, and it sits two degrees south of the equator. Um, at the top, you can see there, you have a series of tephrite tufts, and this is very characteristic of these kinds of volcanoes. And it's an alkaline basalt, broadly, in, in, in its characteristics. So the one I'm going to talk about, though, is a little bit off-center from the main rift valley. It's over on the border between Uganda and... Uh, Uganda's here in Kenya. This is the geological map of Kenya. And, and the shown here in pink are the tertiary volcanics. And as you can see, it's on this uh, Riedel shear zone, which passes from the main rift valley, which goes up towards uh, Lake uh, Kiowa. I have to remember not to call it Lake Albert, which was the old colonial name for it. It has, very typically, it has a peak. Um, the peak itself, as you can see, the basalt columns there. Um, these are uh, melon tephrite, and I always have to remember, look at my notes for the, the height of it. This is 4,321 meters. There's actually five peaks in the Elgon area, which are above 4,000 meters. So this is quite a large uh, mountainous zone. It has a number of eco zones. Um, as you'll see here, you can see the labelli tree. That's uh, an indication of an alpine um, high elevation environment. And you would get that throughout the world, this particular style of vegetation, but you only get it above 3,500 meters. Um, and on the lower slopes, you have more tropical rainforest, as you'll see in a minute. 
this is just another example, a very interesting example of uh, a volcano in this area. This is Aldini Lengai, and it's the world's only known natrocarbonatite. So essentially, it's magma is sodium carbonate, baking soda. And it's coming out at around about 500 degrees C. Um, the brown color that's very unusual for a volcano that you can see here is actually the weathering of the natron and the gregoryite and the other sodium carbonate minerals that form there. And on the next photograph, this one was taken in 2007 when I climbed up there. And that central cone in the middle there was sounding like a jet engine. And the guide I was with, for some reason, was very uncomfortable about being there. Um, and actually, within about six weeks, this cone blew off along with much of the south side of the volcano. So I guess he had good reason. Um, it's, a very vis it's, it's a very viscous magma. It's a, it doesn't look like a silicate metal. It runs quite well. Um, and, and so they tend to produce mainly uh, uh, magma flows rather than uh, to, uh, lamelli tuff or, or tephrite. These are some of the hot springs in the Elgon area. Uh, typically, they are running anywhere between 60 to 100 degrees centigrade. Um, and there is, there was actually no use when I took these photographs. Most of the photographs you'll see here uh, are not particularly great in their reproduction because they're from 35 millimeter slides scanned in. Um, but when I was taking these photographs in the early 90s, there was absolutely no use of these hot springs by anyone other than local chimpanzees who actually used to go bathing in, in the hot springs. And you can see it's surrounded by very lush vegetation. In fact, the slopes around Elcon are important farming areas. A lot of coffee, a lot of tea is grown there, reflecting the nature of the, of the very fertile volcanic soils. And in the um, uh, park itself, you get these um, cloud forests of primary cellitus uh, vegetation. You also get a lot of veg a lot of animals there. So this is uh, the Afri East African buffalo. It's slightly smaller than the Cape buffalo that you're probably more familiar with from photographs from Africa, but it is no less short-tempered. And 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 a, and a photograph like this being taken on foot, which this one was, was really a very stupid thing to do, because that central bull there does like to investigate when a camera makes a click. And I can tell you from personal experience, they run rather well. Fortunately, not as well as a 23-year-old geochemist ran, but they do run very well. There are also large elephants. Uh, this was a particularly large male that we came across in the area. Uh, he was standing approximately twice my height, to give you some reference, and he probably weighed somewhere around about five tons. Not unsurprisingly, I took my Land Rover off the road as he was walking down it, as a gesture of politeness and deference to his, his majesty. Uh, there are giraffes in the area. Um, there are also lions. This one's in a tree. Um, now, lions do occasionally climb trees, much like your pet cats at home. Um, but in East Africa, the reasons why they do it are because, firstly, it's slightly cooler. And secondly, that means there's going to be less black fly there. And so that's why they actually go in the trees. People started to assume it's because they were looking for prey or they were trying to get to safety. But really, a lion doesn't have too much to be worried about in the bush. Um, one of the interesting things about the lions in East Africa, just to diverge away from geology, is you can see the front that they have a very primitive mane. So the mane runs actually in these two males. These are actually black fly, sadly, covering this one. And you can see there's very little of a mane on the front here. I've only recently uh, started to work in Namibia with a paleontologist doing some research, and she actually did her PhD on the evolution of lions. And the lions in this part of East Africa are the nearest genetic relationship to lions is actually in an area of northern Namibia. And these are directly related, their DNA, to the earliest lions, which started to appear 20 million years ago. And it would seem that there's a branch of Panthera leo, which hasn't been clearly identified previously, that actually has remained a pure line from the earliest of the Panthera leo uh, genus. And, and rather than being a single species, it should actually be elevated to a genus and have a series of species developed off it. So quite an interesting sideline, I think, showing that there's still research to be done, even on the largest of animals. There's also leopards, as you can imagine. This one was actually taken near one of the caves. 
and there's chimps as well. And um, if you notice that central, I'm afraid my photography isn't always very good, but you can see the central chimp there. He's actually holding a bush pig. Um, contrary to popular belief, chimpanzees like ourselves are omnivores and they make very good hunters. And they actually hunt as a group to capture their prey. But the caves. So there are a number of caves throughout Mount Elgon. These are all volcanic caves. And you can imagine, particularly where you've got carbonate-rich rocks, much as you would have in limestone country, caves are fairly easy to develop. But of course, you need water. And of, this is a um, cloud rainforest environment, so there's generally considerable amounts of precipitation, around about 2,000 millimeters per annum. So this is the Kitsum Cave, along with my thumb, I've just realized, down in the bottom left corner, a uh, scale, obviously, um, where the elephants uh, enter the caves. Now, unlike many of the caves, which had steep access, like the two I've just shown you, as you can, as you can hopefully see, that the back of the cave through here, there's actually a fairly flat path which comes up on a gradual slope, which is probably why they first started using this particular cave. Occasionally, there is a waterfall. Uh, seasonally, there's a waterfall at these caves. Uh, but the entrance is fairly flat lying, so it's relatively easy for the elephants to enter. Um, unlike popular opinion, elephants are blind in, in dark light. They have a very similar um, visible spectrum in their eyes to what we experience. And so when they enter the caves, they move around by feel using their trunks. So this is the Kittum Cave. Um, the example of elephants going there was actually identified in the 1960s, but not a lot was done about it. And they, they put this slab of rock in there back in the late 1980s, uh, just to try and increase tourism in the area. So this is Mount Elgon as a map. Uh, there's several of the uh, caves through here. Uh, where, and all of these caves in the red uh, hollow circles are ones uh, where evidence of elephants going underground has been observed. Uh, interestingly, the caves outside the park are the only ones where we couldn't find ev evidence that the elephants had been there. Now, some of these caves, like Cull, they've only um, utilized salts on the outside of the cave face. They've not actually entered fully into the caves. Uh, but uh, Mackinglen and Kitsum and Christkeg are the three where we actually see evidence of the elephants going overnight into those particular caves. They're much larger cave systems and they're easily accessible as well, which is probably a major part of it. And so the elephants, um, their composition um, of, these, of the geology of Kitsum Cave anyway is essentially a phonolytic nephilite uh, mixed in with a melanite and, and a, a melonephilonite, uh, an intermediate rock. The things to point out with the primary rock is it's got high titanium, high iron, high aluminium. It has um, high trace elements like vanadium and chromium. These are not essential nutrients for an elephant. Um, and so the actual primary rock is probably undesirable as a nutrient source. Now there is some evidence from the feces, not done by myself, I would hasten to add, where they actually eat some of the primary rock. And uh, if you're a zoologist, of course, you love digging through the feces of animals to see what remains in their feces. And they found primary rock fragments that are largely unaltered within the, within the feces. So clearly there's another reason which drove them to these caves. So the cave, this is just a, a cartoon from the field of the Kitsum Cave. And some of the ideas perhaps that the um, elephants use them for is firstly for safety. Uh, the, the lions within the area around Kitsum um, they have been known or recorded to take young elephants, particularly at night. So herds tend to make use of the caves rather than the bulls. Uh, it could be that because there's water in there as well, there's a nutrient source. And the caves are probably slightly warmer than being stuck outside in a cloud forest during the evening, where the temperature can drop to sort of 5 to 10 degrees centigrade, um, in, certainly in, in, in winter. Um, and so... What do they look like? So these are the elephants underground in the caves, at the back of that cave. And they are feeling their way through the cave in order to find areas where there's nutrients. Now, the nutrients they're looking for within these caves are on the side of the boulders, which, are, uh, which they um, investigate with their trunks, and on the floors and on the side walls. Occasionally, you see them uh, reaching up into the top of the cave um, for the larger elephants, and they will pull down rock fragments. Uh, this is a, a colleague of mine in there, and you can see that 
the scratchings on the sides um, of, of the cave there and the marks of the fresh rock. I have to point out the reason when we did this work, we weren't um, aware that there was um, a potential to pick up a virus from the bats in this area, Maybugs uh, virus, which is a horrible uh, hemorrhagic uh, type fever or virus uh, related to Ebola with very similar symptoms. And it's only more recent researchers like uh, Ian, this is one of Ian's party, and he sent me this photograph. Uh, they're now suited up. I was wearing shorts and flip-flops when I went in there, so. PPE is definitely required in there, it would seem. Uh, there's also lots of these things. This, see, these are particular, this is a, a colony of Egyptian fruit bats. Um, there's also Rosatas, uh, long-eared bat, and the pipsqueak bat as well, all fruit bats. Uh, and they're very jumpy animals you know so so if you go too close to them they do try to leave their roosts what's interesting is in the cave mount you might be able to see on the back wall here this regular pattern here that's actually a large tree trunk that fallen into the volcano and because this is a low temperature magma it's actually replaced the structure of the tree trunk and you can get some wonderful uh, mineralized fossils there by zeolite and calcite of, of form of vegetation. And in fact, one specimen in the Nairobi Museum from Kittum is, is actually this beautifully preserved uh, verbet monkey, and it's been completely altered to zeolite minerals. But you can still make out that it's a verbet monkey. Um, there's also a lot of um, stalactites. These are natron, net sodium carbonate stalactites in the caves that form roosts. And also the elephants will break these off and eat them much as you would have a, an icicle pop. And there are also lots of zeolite minerals. The scale bar there is a meter. So that gives you some idea how large some of these are. This particular one is philipsite, which is actually the most common of the zeolites um, in these particular caves. Uh, this is a fairly standard piece of fresh uh, melanite from there with analcite. Um, these uh, nice crystals in here with some uh, stellarite and also with mesolite in filling some of the vesicles. They tend not to eat these rocks, these fresh rocks. Um, you've got nice crystals, but they're probably quite hard to digest and break down. Um, you also get a lot of uh, mesolite in there, which is a calcium sodium zeolite and ocanite as well. So it's this particular material the elephants are focused on, the highly weathered version of the rock and of the zeolite salt. They particularly like it when it's on the floor, and there's some evidence that the elephants are actually breaking off fresh rock fragments and leaving them on the floor for a period of time in order to come back and make use of them, showing that they have memory, uh, which is a deliberate action memory, um, to quarry this particular rock. The water chemistry is also part of the story here. Now, I apologize for the reproduction here. It didn't come out very well from the paper. Um, but the, essentially, the waters here are very alkaline, as you can imagine. You're in sodium carbonate rock, very high in sodium, very high carbonate. Um, if you look at the X scale, you can see that we've got um, waters underground. That's about 800 milligrams per liter, which for a, a groundwater is, is a very high alkaline content. You're at saturation with respect to calcium carbonate and very close to saturation with respect to sodium carbonate in these waters, showing they're dominated by the immediate chemistry of the wall rocks that the waters flow through. They also tend to have fairly low chloride and sulfate in them. Um, and these are colleagues uh, doing what zoologists do best, which is why you always take a biologist into the field so that he can do this kind of sampling and you can take the photographs. And the combination of that water that's very alkaline and very warm of the feces of the bat guano is it produces a unique range of salts within the crust. So the feces from bat guana. Guana is unusual in that these are fruit bats, so they discharge very high nitrates, very high phosphates in their feces. It's basically a mixture of a very weak nitric acid, uh, urea, and phosphoric, phosphoric acid. So it can react with a carbonatite rock in an acid-base reaction, which I'm sure you all learned in early chemistry classes, and it produces salts. And in this case, they're salts which contain magnesium, potassium, sodium, some ammonia, um, a little bit of chloride, some sulfate, phosphate. These are all essential nutrients that are required by the elephants. And so this is why they make use of these salts. And this is why they scrape these salts. 
There is some evidence, and it's very conjectural evidence, that we see the elephants on the ground throwing dust in the air. Now, initially it was thought this was part of a cooling mechanism, which elephants do very commonly on the surface. But underground, the temperature is quite low. So it seems a strange action for them. It could be done to control insects on their body. Uh, but there's very few in the caves. So that doesn't seem to make sense. A third reason, which I favor, is that the elephants actually use it to move the bat roosts around the caves and try and focus the bats around the areas where they've quarried the rock. So you get, in the zeolites and the quarried areas, you get areas where the zeolites have now been altered. Um, and I've got to find my notes to remember which ones these are, so I don't tell you the wrong thing. So this is philipsite, which has been now altered to both marabolite and hexahydrite. Hexahydrite is a magnesium sulfate. Uh, marabolite is a sodium sulfate. Here we can see uh, ampholite, which is a potassium sulfate. It's a very common salt that you add to your garden as, pot as a potash, uh, potassium sulfate. And it's mixed in here with hexahydrite natron. And it's basically breaking down mesolite. And you can still see there's some remnants of mesolite within this fragment. On this electron microscope image, we can see here that there's some uh, natron starting to form as plates. And it's sitting in between analcite crystals. And the, there's some uh, wires here which are related to lone creekite being formed. And there's some alteration of the surface where you're starting to precipitate onto the fresh analcite uh, marabolite, a sodium sulfate. This is uh, an electron microscope of a very advanced salt crust. This was on the floor salts. And this is an ammonium-rich sulfate, solid solution, teshmeriite, lone creekite. It forms these very fibrous minerals, and it's associated here with a mineral called nitromagnesite. It's a magnesium carbonate nitrate mineral, so it's highly soluble. And, and we can follow these reactions by looking at the XRD as well as the chemistry. So we go from a rock, which is, you can see here the quartz peak, you can see it's um, a silicate rock, feldspars, uh, a little bit quartz, a little bit of uh, pyroxenes, and as we go through the reaction zones, we start to lose the silicates, and what we form are minerals which are, have a lower um, angle of diffraction, and these are sulfates and nitrates. And you can tell by the lowering of the peaks that they're actually poorly crystalline, as opposed to the highly crystalline primary rock, which you can see in black. And the chemistry of these are important because now if you look at this chemistry, you can see that things like chromium and vanadium are halved in value in the salt crusts. This is a series of, of um, salt licks. So the cave salt is the chemistry on the far right of the table. And you can see here there's only 16% silica now, as opposed to 40 to 50% in the primary rock. Um, sulfate has increased a lot because we're now forming potassium sulfate salts. Um, really, a lot of those salts don't actually change very much in their macro amount. What's changed is their mineralogy by that alteration and weathering. So it's become a more bioavailable form of the salts. And if you look at the, the a chemical profile, this is on a centimeter range. So there's, the, the salt crusts themselves are not very thick, uh, perhaps 8 to 10 centimeters in thickness. But the elephants are just simply scraping it off with their trunks. So they're only disturbing that zone. So we see that silica and aluminium and iron all decrease through the salt crust. We can see there's actually a slight increase in potassium and sodium, but importantly, things like uh, phosphorus increase, calcium and magnesium increase, and some of the more deleterious elements like zirconium, uh, copper, chromium, they've all decreased. And, and things like iodine has actually increased going across. So iodine is another nutrient that they require, and that only forms as an evaporitic salt. And it's probably come from the groundwater and has formed a saturated salt. So to give you a summary cartoon, there's three zones to this. There's the alkaline volcanic rock. There's a mixed zone in which we see um, a, a diffusion of certain elements that we're retaining or we're mobilizing highly soluble, nutrient-rich material into a hydromorphic crust, which forms, and the residual uh, silicate uh, material, and iron and aluminium, is left behind. Within that zone, we see things like smectite and goethite, leucoxine being formed, and then on the outside crust, we see things like potash, magnesium sulfate, and so on. So, in conclusion, the elephants, they're geologists, they've identified these caves. Other species actually follow them, including local farmers who bring their cattle seasonally to the salt licks inside the caves. 
They mine the rocks by pulling them down, breaking them down. It's possible that they process the rocks by encouraging the bats to roost in certain areas. They can stir the consumer and they produce tailings, which of course get recycled. That, in case you're not aware, that's a dung beetle. Uh, uh, as to the future, um, it's developed a lot since I went there, and it's, uh, it's been over 10 years since I was last in this area. Uh, they've now developed a tourist route and hiking paths around there. The, the crime, which used to riddle this area, is considerably less, and there's been a lot of investment going into the park, and there's been reintroduction of species. There's been a great reduction in, in poaching in the area, and it's actually really one of the, the success stories of the area. And uh, these were actually taken by a friend of mine there, Paul Molassi, and he, uh, some photographs he sent me. And essentially, they are looking to reintroduce gorillas back into this area in the next two to three years. It was a, traditionally a gorilla uh, area, uh, and it was within their range. Unfortunately, the gorillas were poached to the point of extinction in this area, and now they're being reintroduced, which I think is great. And the tourism associated with going to the elephants in small groups and, and the hiking around the area is really supporting local communities to support the park and not carry out the poaching. So it's an interesting case of um, various parts of the ecosystem working together to create sustainability and hopefully it's one that will carry on. Thank you for listening.